Um, today, I have a conversation with two people, two ladies, and um, that's the first for me, I believe, and it's going to be also interesting to see how this is going to work out. And that's because of um, the work that they do and this book. Uh, if you watch the video, you can see the book, but the book is called Moose Heads on the Table. I'm talking to Karen Tolinius and Lisa Jill. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what I normally do is I investigate, in a, uh, not investigate, research a little bit on the internet, uh, look through your LinkedIn profile, look at the websites and everything. But all of the stuff that's really important is already written in a book about, about what you do and, and your history. So that, that made it a lot easier for me. Um, let's start off with um, your first... I am thinking, I'm thinking, where are we going to start? <laughs> I'm, um, yeah, let's, no, let's, let's start, uh, Karen, Karen, with your um, first um, real practice that's, 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 that you wrote about in the book, that Lisa wrote about in the book, is about the story with the hotel. Yeah, exactly. How, how, did, how, did, you, how did you get there? How did, how, did, how did you got the nerve to start this process, process in, in the hotel? Yeah, so... A lot of things happened before that uh, th uh, that moment. Of course, I uh, studied uh, service management in the eighties uh, in marketing, and I uh, read a lot about uh, that service quality was. It was very important to trust and give authority to the people that gave service, and we also had the Swedish guy. Uh, in SAS, the airline then, who who had those thoughts. So it was very sort of up in the air. And I think the, the biggest thing was also that I re uh, read the book by Ricardo Semler. So I was working in a big organization then, an a, a, a educational company or training company, where there were very uh, radical people around me. So even back then, we tried those ideas, but not as radical. So so I was quite convinced that it would work. Uh, and also this uh, CEO in the hotel was uh, very brave and, and uh, daring. So it was good circumstances. You talk about it was already at the company you work was very um, forward thinking. They were ahead of time. How how did it, how did that work for you? How did it work in the company? Uh, in the hotel, you mean? No, no, in in the one that you were. Oh, oh, that didn't work so well. Or it worked well uh, as long as we had a management that were quite open-minded. But it was in a booming time in Sweden, so they got recruited to much fancier works. So they disappeared, and we were stuck with the traditional uh, top management. And then it didn't work at all which was why I left. And then you started working for your own. Yeah. That was, that was a breaking point for you that it's going to be very difficult to work for a boss anymore? No, I, I was young and didn't think so much. So I just, it happened because somebody phoned me and asked if I could teach women entrepreneurship in, in Estonia. And uh, I never taught anything, and I said no three times, and then I said yes, and all of a sudden I was a sort of a consultant. So it it wasn't so much thought, but it was more coincidences, and uh, yeah, just happened. I can I can imagine because because I I I read about a lot a, a, a lot about the importance of luck and coincidence. It, in in the decisions that you make and a lot of people they think they make very wise decisions and they everything they say is okay i made this decision and then this happened but they forget the part of the luck and i, and I love it yeah. that you are so uh clear about that part in your and in, in that decision <laughs> um so then you started working in that hotel what happened what changed um in the hotel, um, so 
we started out by telling about this idea to give them the authority to run the hotel together. And first what happens was that they were very hesitant. And that was because the CEO who was a woman, uh, who was very competent, very inspiring and very powerful. So they didn't trust that that was the case sort of. Uh, so they were very hesitant. And so that was the first thing, but then they got that this was for real and then things started to happen and they stepped in. And this was the moment when I saw engagement and responsibility occur to an extent that was that I never saw before in a team. And, and I really got that, that this was something different. So, so it actually worked better than you expected? Uh, I mean, it wasn't easy. It was not like a quick fix or so, but I could see their mindset and their way of being. And, and, and they, I mean, this hotel was very successful and people loved working there. So it's, it was not that it had been bad before. So it was a good, and then, but I saw this commitment and ownership evolve and things happen by themselves. People taking initiatives, taking, doing things that they wouldn't have done, uh, not because they were lazy, but they, they became owners in their mindset. They became mental owners and, and things started to evolve out of that. What was the effect of that attitude change for the numbers for the, for the hotel? Well, we didn't expect any uh, change because it was so uh, good, in good shape financially. But six, uh, six months um, after we started, uh, the profit increased by, I think, 26% plus 20 something, which was totally unexpected. And, and not like what we did this out of wanting to experiment rather than having uh, an improvement the, the board and the owners didn't think there were any potential financially in this hotel. Is that number, Lisa, something that you see in other examples as well? That you make an improvement in the financial status of the company? I think, yeah, I mean, I think it depends. And I, I'm, I'm always a bit hesitant to to highlight this because I think if if people are entering into an experiment or, or a transformation to become a self-managing organization and their main motivation is, hey, let's be more profitable or let's make more money. I think that that's a bit of a dangerous ambition to have um, because it's, it is very hard and often, often things can get worse before they get better. And so then people can very quickly drop it and say, oh, it fails, it doesn't work. So I think, um, I'm always a little bit hesitant to say that there are, you know, financial benefits to, to doing this. Yes. But having, having said that, I think um, th there are definitely many cases that show uh, that there is a, a bottom line benefit to self-management for lots of reasons, but partly because you're often you're taking away management positions which are often you know very high salaries and they're doing work that is you could say not adding value directly uh, and so they then put themselves to tasks that are more directly adding value to the organization and it frees them up to do and often it's tasks that they want to do you know real work and innovative stuff instead of kind of the administration of management and, and all of that stuff um, and also because you're freeing up many more people's brains and hearts and creativity and so all kinds of ideas uh, come to the surface as well as you know people pointing out waste and things like that so in many of the cases that we talk about in the book uh, the organizations karen worked with lots of people came up with good ideas for cost saving um, and so that's obviously kind of a benefit um, and another example that is a, a, a consultancy in, the, in Spain, in the Basque country, and they've transformed 80 plus companies now. They're, um, they're called K2K. And their, their transformations show quite fast, like many of the cases that, that Karen's uh, worked with as well, quite fast 
shifts in numbers um, where it's often surprising to them, even though they've seen it time and time again, that the, the figures do shift because you're freeing up mainly because you're freeing up a lot of energy. Right. And getting yeah. rid of a lot of waste. Yeah. And I can add also that, so, so what we're talking about is to see it as a side effect. The money comes as a side effect, which is quite important view point here. And also, of course, you release uh, common sense on, on the same time. So if owners are really, really overly greedy, for instance, that won't work. <laughs> so in that sense, uh, it's not about maximizing profit because uh, in the process, the, it will be questioned, uh, which I think is a good thing. But, but I, can you explain a bit more about the common sense part? Because I don't... Yeah, so, so when, when, when you work as a team, more team-based, uh, more aspects uh, come, more, more creativity, more aspects come up and also common sense and I think common sense is not to maximize the profit on the most money out of a business. Uh, so, so the company or the business is run with more sort of uh, sustainability in mind, uh, like uh, not sort of profit in as the first priority. Uh, so that happens when you give away authority that there are more wisdom uh, released and more common sense and, and more sustainable decisions are made. And sustainable, does it mean sustainable also for the environment and for the, um, okay, see, okay. And, and so, so profit is not the, the most important, but you need profit to survive as a business. Definitely, definitely. I'm all for being business-like and, you know, uh, do profit so you can survive and sustain. Uh, so that's not, not wrong, but yeah, but yeah, I don't know. But uh, the decisions are more thoughtful. You can sort of look at risks more thoroughly if, than if just one, maybe very one uh, uh, enthusiastic person drives the whole thing or so. So I can see very many entrepreneurs who run fast <laughs> and don't think so much second thoughts or sort of uh, es es estimate risk. So, so decisions tend to be more uh, grounded and wise. Mm -hmm. I also was kind of like disappointed at the end of the story in hotel because once the person that was so involved with this uh, idea left the company, it went back to just regular business. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that happen. And we interviewed a guy here in Sweden a couple of years ago, Lisa and I, who was very uh, pioneering in, in this. And he turned around the company totally. And then it was bought by a British company. And six months later, it was back to normal. So it's vulnerable. Uh, if owners come in or a new manager, um, it has to be very, very solid and robust to, to sustain. Because power rules hmm. is that is that not disappointing sometimes it is that's why i started to buy companies myself yes okay before we go to that um lisa um can you maybe explain a little bit about um because that was in the first chapter as well the um first pillar yeah, so, so the, the first pillar, and, and really to, to preface this by saying that, um, you know, there are lots of really great books out there that write about new ways of organizing, and I say new ways of organizing, but of course a lot of these ways of organizing are not new, so to speak, but we're seeing them being taken up in more of the mainstream now. It's still niche, but there's more of an appetite now for these things. Um, and so there are great books like Reinventing Organizations and Brave New Work. And Karen and I really wanted to write this book because what we feel is less written about is, um, is not so much structures and processes, but how to, how to um, shift one's mindset and way of being and way of relating to each other. Because that human stuff, the less tangible, less visible stuff, 
uh, we have found in our experience is really crucial to having self-management work. So you can, you can change the structures and processes, but underneath we're the same humans. And we have this, often we're, we're blind to the sort of dynamics that we're conditioned into in hierarchical ways of being with each other from school, family, uh, workplaces, of course. So the first, the first pillar which Karen developed as part of this approach, both from her background in coaching and, and coaching many, many, many job seekers when there was a crisis in Sweden, and then also through these experiments with transforming organizations. Um, one of the key pieces that she discovered and is also now part of tough leadership training, the courses that we run when we teach these skills to leaders and managers uh, it's about uh, having a coaching adult-to-adult -adult leadership mindset and way of being. Um, and we have some, some sort of criteria that we use to, to sort of develop that. But, but the idea is really that how, you know, how I relate to you, for example, profoundly impacts how you show up and whether or not you choose to draw on your full potential. So if I relate to you in a kind of parent-child way, or if I relate to you in a way where I don't really trust that you're capable or I'm going to swoop in at some point and come in with solutions or advice, then you're, you pick up on that as a human being. You know, our brains are very sophisticated and you sense that I don't relate to you fully as another capable adult, even if it's not conscious. Um, and so the first pillar is, is all about becoming aware of that we have this um, automatic way of being because of the society that we all live in, um, which is a little bit parent child. And then if we can become aware of that, then we can start to train and get feedback and practice and unlearn and learn new ways of being that are more chosen and more favorable to having self-management or more decentralized ways of working work. Do you think it is um, kind of standard for employees to to put themselves in this child parent position? Not like being child with children for real, but one can conclude it by being a bit waiting. And I have seen so clever, smart, educated competent people end up there. You, it's amazing <laughs> that they end up in this waiting situation. It's, uh, and it's such a loss. <laughs> yeah, and we also experience it with organizations that we speak to often when we talk to founders or owners who say, you know, we've declared self-management, we've give, given people permission. Why is no one stepping up? Why, are no, why is no one taking responsibility or making decisions? They seem like they're waiting for something and they can get very impatient and frustrated and think, oh, maybe it doesn't work. Maybe people need to be told what to do. But the truth is that it takes, it takes a lot of holding space and having conversations and talking about what's in the way for people to really step in because they're not used to it. You know, so many people, as Karen said, it doesn't matter how smart or creative or competent you are, You've been conditioned from a child that, you know, there's a hierarchy and the, the manager tells you what your job description is or decides what training you do or what salary you get and they make decisions. So it's unconscious. Um, so it takes, it takes a lot of courage and practice and space for people to unlearn that and to start to dare to step in and take more responsibility, ask for what they need, challenge things, question things, make proposals, decide things. All of this, uh, you know, I think requires a lot of compassion and patience and courage. So it's, it's, it's much more than just permission or an announcement. You know, there's, there's a lot of, um, it's psychological safety, really, that we need to craft a combination of psychological safety and accountability. So again, it's this adult, adult. It's not well, let's make it cozy and comfy and safe because that's also not good. That's like going too far in the other direction, but it's this magical combination. And that, you know, that's not, we don't learn that in business schools or in workplaces or, so that's, that's a key piece. I think that that's. Um, 
and it could be very good bosses that all, they are still you know having this impact because they're so knowledgeable or driving uh, and they could be really really good managers and i mean really human managers and and but still they have this um is this dynamic in in place i see that i see that a lot too with the companies that i work with is that so these competent people just knock on the the door of the boss and ask them so i have this what do i need to do there or can you help me this or what do i need to buy here and it's it, of course it's it's very easy then as a as a as a manager or as, a, or as a, the, the entrepreneur to just quickly answer that question and because you're both very busy and um say okay you just you just purchase it there or you just do this or you just go there and um and exactly i think that part is to just hastily um accommodate the person that's coming with the question yeah. um just exactly creates this whole situation of of a child uh, parent yes and it's it it's a habit right and it it takes a long time to change this habit it it's a matter of being aware of it because no one knows this we haven't met one manager that is aware of it because they're in a paradigm and you're blind so they are no they have the best of intentions it's not nothing wrong with managers but they're totally blind and when they come into our trainings they think they are coaching especially in Sweden where we talked about this for 30 years they think that they are involving listening and coaching they know it all already so when we point out and uh, reveal that that's not the case, they get a shock. Are they, are they getting upset? No. Okay. Uh, well, not upset. Oh, some gets upset, but not that's not COVID. I mean, 20, 15 years ago, people got really upset, but not nowadays. Now they get astonished. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. So... You just already mentioned it before. Uh, let's go there now. Um, at one point, you decided, I need to buy a company. Okay, that sounds like a, um, I would say, crazy idea. Yeah, <laughs> it was. Because <laughs> you have a business and then you say, okay, I need to really test this. Just I need to buy my own company to test it. It was after uh, some failures that I didn't exactly account for in the book. I said that there were failures. So there were three attempts in restaurant businesses where I worked as a consultant to implement those uh, ways of working. And the conditions, I learned a lot from it. Uh, the conditions weren't good and the the... The, the, the most lacking condition was that the managers couldn't shift. I mean, they were so stuck in the old traditional way. And, and then the insight was that it's, it doesn't work not to have the full authority, the full ownership, the full power. And it was also combined with uh, our training company was so much ahead in ideas that we struggled uh, so it was not so inspiring those um, times because it was too early. We did something, but it was very hard to get ourselves established. So it was uh, like different factors that led to this. Uh, and it was still that we needed proof to, to show the world that this is a good idea. Uh, and we thought we learn a lot and we get a proof. But in hindsight, I mean, I wish... I, yeah, it was a crazy idea. <laughs> well, I, I think again here, I like the stories, uh, but both at the end are kind of disappointing because mm. it's not it's not like a great success, right? So it, it, the best thing you could read in a book like this is, oh, yeah. I did this and it it was just an amazing yeah. success, but and it and it wasn't. Yeah. Of, of well, course, I, I, um, I liked the part at the second company you bought where in the end, um, it was clearly about the people, that the people um, were set like free, right? Free of the old concept and in with the new one. So, so, so yeah. I, I thought that was really, that was a success, but in a different way than you hope if, when you buy a company. Yeah. 
Yes, I, I can say something about that because the, the obvious successes is the second one, the, the, the training company and the computing, the IT company. They were true successes. And then I thought, oh, this is it, you know. Uh, and what we learned also is uh, that in those companies, there were people working that were really committed and inspired by what they were doing. So technicians, uh, IT guys, they didn't want to be somewhere else. When we bought a, first we bought a healthcare company uh, and then we bought a call center. And those people were not so, they were not as uh, uh, you know, obviously on the right place. So we learned a lot from different conditions also. And also, of course, there was competence in the, those two, comp two success stories. There were competence there that you can trust. We thought there were competence in, in the ones we bought, but it was not enough competence there. Uh, and so the circumstances were much, much harder. Um, so I, I really can see what you mean. It, it almost felt like these people were like stuck there. Mm, yes. Yeah. Especially in the in the call center, of course. Yeah. 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 Yes. And and I don't know if you re uh, read that part, but that what we I think we sort of concluded that if it had been like an other project of people's development or you know uh, people growing uh, professionally, that then it would have been a super success. No, I no, I read that. Yes, I did. I did. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I think of course you. It was. Um, like we said before, how much luck influences uh, the results of your decisions. In this case, it, of course, it was bad luck that you bought the company that in the end was not, the timing in the market was not right anymore and yeah. um, it all stepped away. Also, we should have uh, kicked out the, the, the owner much earlier and stuff like that. So, yeah. So, if, uh, if we had been even more radical in some respects, it might be, have been another outcome, but... I don't know. I think for me, the learning uh, was the most valuable in the end. I mean, mm -hmm. this is sort of a couple of years later and, and so on. Uh, and I should not have done it exactly the same. I've been more careful about business things, I think. What is, what is the most important thing that you learned there? The most important, not to... Yeah, it's like check things out before, <laughs> check things uh, more thoroughly. And uh, I've been I've been really good uh, because people have wanted to do the same thing as me uh, after this. And I've been a very good advisor because I had so much don't do this <laughs> advice <laughs> because I didn't check thoroughly. I, I did things fast. I can imagine that the experience is very valuable for the company, for you as a CEO, but for TIFF in general as a company. Yes. Yeah. Um, but what I what I what I have difficulty understanding, right, is that you said I should have checked more. I was too has I was too hasty, and um, but you had to convince your partners to invest in this company. How, how can you do that? Yeah. Um... Yeah, the, the, the short answer is that I think they had so much trust in me um, as we have worked together for so many years, many of us, and especially the people that invested back then. So my ideas have very been welcomed um, with, you know, positive, um, but, uh, but so I think that is that they trust that I know what I'm doing and have good ideas, sort of. Uh, although they learned a lot about owning companies in the process. Uh, so that also strengthened tough um, in, in many ways yeah. because the people are still there. And now when we sort of uh, deal with the corona crisis as everyone else in the world, we have a totally different uh, foundation because we had ride through those other crises before with each other uh, and had conflicts and fear and, and, and things running us. Uh, and now there's so much um, 
calmness and uh, capacity there. It's amazing. I was stunned by that. So, so what is helping you the most now in this time? Uh, that we know, we, uh, the trust is so solid, I would think. We trust each other and we trust our capacity to solve anything right, together. Right. right. Okay. Um, Lisa, pillar number two. <laughs> yeah, so, so pillar number two is uh, sometimes sounds a bit more abstract, I guess you could say, but it's, it's to focus on um, what we call like working climate. Uh, and one way, one way of thinking about it is like, if you imagine a kind of, it's a bit of a cliche nowadays, but if you imagine like an iceberg diagram, most, most companies spend almost all of their time talking about surface issues, which is important, which is things like, you know, operational things, budgets, schedules, the work. Um, but underneath, you know, the huge part of the iceberg that we don't tend to talk about in businesses is, um, is the more human stuff, the trickier stuff. So it's things like the climate, how it feels in the team, like the quality of the atmosphere, um, dynamics between people, history, you know, issues that might have gone on um, in the past that have, haven't quite been resolved or there's like a bit of residue of, you know, bitterness or something going on there. And all of this stuff is in the way for people to really collaborate, for teams to be really high performing. I would say even, you know, regardless of whether you want to be self-managing or not, if you can start to talk about things like the working climate or things under the surface, the relationships, the quality of how we relate to each other, there's so much potential there. And this was really something that I wasn't familiar with before I met Karen and started working with Tuff. And when we started to write the book together, for me, it was like a game changer that this sort of, this, this uh, arena was just so rich with learning. And I think even today, a lot of companies that are very progressive in how they're organized, this is still a terrain that they haven't ventured into yet um, because we're, we're so conflict avoidant, I think, as human beings. Um, and, you know, I even like the term conflict transformation instead of conflict resolution. Um, so I think part of, uh, part of pillar two and part of what I love about being part of tough now and, and what I've learned perhaps the most is that there's such magic on the other side of conflicts and on the other side of talking about things that are difficult to talk about together, that if we can dare to do that, and it's not easy, you know, in tough, uh, I've only been with tough for um, four years, I think, but, you know, some of my colleagues have been working there for, you know, more than a decade, and they've been practicing this together for that long. And still it takes courage and it takes, it's a bit like, I don't know, taking medicine or something, you know, it doesn't taste nice. It's not easy, but you do it because it's good for you. <laughs> um, so yeah, pillar two to me is, is one of the really interesting ones. And I think there's so much potential if people can get their hands on this one. And that, and that is um, the title of the book comes from that pillar actually. Yeah. So I, I, I talked to you before, I said, I, I will be interesting to learn what the title means. And it really comes from this part is that, um, the moose's head is like a stinking problem that's in um, somewhere in disguise and you need to talk about it to get it out and to get it on the table. And, and you just need to get people in the room to talk about the stuff that's going on that nobody wants to talk about. And it, I agree, it's a very tough thing to talk about. It's a very difficult thing to talk about. So tell me a little bit more about this transformation idea. The idea of transforming the um, well, yeah, the problem. I say, yeah, so this is also not my idea from the beginning. I mean, the teachings of, for instance, Will Schutz with the fundamental, uh, in, what is called, interpersonal orientation uh, theory, FIRO. Um, so I had that very early. I met with him and his organization in the 90s. So it's all there in theory, or Susan Whelan nowadays, sort of. So we know that open, uh, straightforward feedback climate is productive. We know that in theory, but that's so different. So it's, 
there's hardly, I mean, it's very few people that, or, that experienced an open, trustful uh, climate. Uh, they might have done it in the scouts or in the football or somewhere, in, if they're lucky, you know, but not in the workplace. Um, so, uh, and, and I think also the concrete learning was when I worked with unemployed people, uh, where I, I was confronted by groups of people that were sort of forced to be in, an, in a group uh, and they didn't want to be there. And uh, the idea was to support them to have a job. And I understood that nothing would happen here that was good <laughs> with this atmosphere. And then there came the thought, is it possible to shift atmospheres? And then I just uh, tried out to, to do that by talking about what was going on and inviting people to participate instead of having to and sort of uh, doing a lot of, of stuff that shifted the climate. And, and then now, and, and that sort of, yeah, we got better and better and better on it after doing it many, many, many times. Mm -hmm. do, do you know why we think it is so difficult to um, tell the truth to hurt people? We don't, we hadn't trained at it in school or, or so, maybe more nowadays in Sweden, at least, hopefully. But I also think we don't think it matters. We don't think it's uh, necessary. We, we, we think it's the surface issues and, and the, the business that is important. And, and we're so in, efficient in that, in project managing, and, and we're so good. Uh, but so we don't think it's matter. We don't understand how much it matters. That's, then, then we would do it more. I would also add that um, in terms of like neuroscience as well, just the way that we are designed as humans. Um, a book I read a few years ago that really changed my thinking is a book called Social, Why Our Brains Are Wired to Connect by Matthew Lieberman. And he talks about how our brains perceive uh, social threats and social pain in the same way as our brains receive physical pain. So the, the, the fear of someone ignoring me in a meeting, for example, or, or becoming upset with me, or the fear of me hurting someone else and that resulting in something bad is very real. Like the brain... Does, is wired to avoid things like that. You know, a human brain is wired for social connection and to stay in the tribe and not get kicked out and eaten by a saber toothed tiger or whatever. So um, it is in, in a lot of ways, the, you know, the, the methodology that Karen's developed and kind of um, has been inspired by is, tr is sort of guardrails in a way to help train us for, I was thinking the other day about plants, you know, you have, I have tomato plants growing on my balcony and you, you give them, you know, sticks to help kind of guide them to grow in the right direction. Um, because if you don't do that, then they'll grow in a you know, not good direction. And I think as humans, it helps us to have support and social systems to, to help us to grow in the direction, which isn't comfortable necessarily, but it's beneficial. Um, and, and if we don't do that, our brain will always take the path of least resistance, the path of least pain or threat of pain. Um, so I think part of it is, as Karen says, conditioning and lack of education in these things and lack of seeing the value of them. You know, we outsource conflict to HR and it's dirty. It's like, oh no, there's a conflict. We need to do conflict resolution or, or we avoid it. Whereas conflict is so natural for groups of human beings, we're completely diverse. We have totally different experiences and values and personalities. Of course, we're going to have conflicts. And if we can see them, if we can have a mindset, which is more positive, if we can see conflicts as, you know, if we can transform this together, if we can talk about it, then we can transform it. And on the other side of conflicts, there's so much gold, you know, there's deeper relationships, new perspectives, shared understanding, you know, new ideas, divergence, all kinds of things. Um, and so I really think if we can support each other to lean into conflicts and see them as like, there's so much value on the other side, they don't have to be these, you know, shameful, horrible things, but mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and the funny thing is that if you ask people at workplaces what they want in, at work, they want respectful, 
openness, they want uh, trust, they want straightforward communication, feedback, they want everything of that. I'm reading a book which is called um, You're Not Listening. I want to learn more about listening because everybody always talks about communication, right? So communication is a very important part in this, in this um, uh, um, pillar you're talking about. But listening is a, is a very difficult part in this, in this whole communication. I, I, most people tend to just talk a lot and, and you need to just listen to other people and just give them time and to explain and, and just um, um, probe deeper, just go deeper with your questions instead of just giving solutions or just handing out ideas what they could do. Um, oh, and so I think, I think that's, for me, that was a really insightful thing to just focus on listening for a while. Um, so, because it, it just, I think it just helps other people to communicate better with me. Yes, true. That's the crucial skill. Okay. Um, let's go with the third pillar. Um, so the third pillar is um is to create a culture of we, we we call it like mandate and involvement and they, they sort of sound like opposite things um but if i say something a bit about what we mean by that so a culture of uh, mandate and involvement means as as karen says she has this lovely phrase giving giving away the authority um and in in order to do that it's helpful to to think about mandate you know what what do what mandate um do i and other people have to do certain things it helps to be clear about that so if particularly if you're a leader it's about giving the mandate to people to say you know i really want you to to be involved in this or for you to make the decisions i'm going to relate to you as in that way and and it works the other way around too to get the mandate for things so usually as managers we assume that we have like a God-given right to give feedback, for example, <laughs> that we can go around vomiting feedback on our employees and we're allowed to do that and it's fine. And they just have to be kind of willing participants of that. But if, if I instead get the mandate to give someone feedback, then, then a powerful thing happens where instead of being like a, a passive recipient of the feedback, we become co-responsible for that conversation if I say, you know, I, I'd like to give you some feedback because I think I see something that's in the way for you to be, you know, even more successful or for you to be a, you know, I know you're really interested in leadership and I think I see something, is it okay if I give you some feedback? And if that person then says yes, you know, in the full transparency of what this conversation is about, then now you're both in an adult to adult conversation, you're jointly responsible and they can also say no. So it's important Peter Block talks about this often in his books in a really nice way that if we cannot say no, then yes is meaningless. So to, to get the mandate to do certain things, you know, is it okay if I do this? Yes, um, is really important. Um, and then the second piece involvement is kind of is self-explanatory really that, and a lot, again, a lot of organizations talk about, we've known this for decades, like involving people is good for the culture and innovation and blah, blah, blah. But rarely do we actually do that you know like so many times i've spoken to leaders in organizations and again as karen said it's not wrong or bad it's not that they're bad people it's just unconscious you know like people have asked me questions like you know i'm thinking if you wondering if you have any ideas lisa of what like well-being initiatives we can do in the company you know we really want to have a great culture and reward employees for their great work you know what are some of your ideas? And the first thing, of course, I say is, well, have you asked them? <laughs> and, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't think about that. <laughs> so, you know, well-intentioned managers the world over often, you know, decide things in darkened rooms and they don't even think to involve people. Um, so, so, yeah, the third pillar is about getting and giving away the mandate and involving people really not just saying it but really involving people which again takes courage and letting go and trust yeah i i have to just repeat that part because i've it was like a light bulb for me just now um so the people come to you and they ask they ask you as an organization to train them to help them to coach them to whatever um, 
get people involved and to do more stuff that's good for the company. And the first question you ask is, did you ask them? Of course, that's a question you ask. Of course, and of course, nobody did. <laughs> so, so I'm just repeating it because I think it's really insightful. Um, yeah, and it and it also to say that you know it's it's something that as tough we try to stand for this as well in the way that we work with clients. So, if we, for example, if we go into an organization because we've been given an assignment to shift the working climate in a team, part of the first step of that process before we do anything when we meet the team the first time we give them the opportunity to choose whether they do this or not because often it's hr that's brought us in um but we say to them like we are not going to do this if you don't agree to it if you don't consent to it so we'll share something about the purpose and what it involves and you can ask questions for you to be able to make a decision yes or no um and we've and that it's it's not just you know um, an administrative thing. It also totally shifts the participation of people. It, they go from like oh here's another thing that HR has sent us on to okay well now that I've like consented to this I've actually actively said okay now I know what this is and I'm choosing it now I can't be a victim of this or a sort of reluctant participant but I'm a co-producer. Um, so I think it, we try to we try to live this as well in the way that we work. With people as well and that that actually came i'm looking at your career now that actually came back from the beginning of the book right because the first thing that you wrote about is about the contract yeah. can you explain a bit about that yeah so this way of working uh, involves freedom uh, of to participate um, so you have to enroll or invite people to to participate uh, that's that that's that's where you get the engagement and the responsibility and and to do an invitation there has to be a chance to say no a freedom of choice of course also when we bought companies people were really scared about the new owners and we said the first thing we said was that we won't decide anything that's that you not that you you not uh, aligned with sort of uh, from now on uh, but one thing that we want is, uh, or that we want to decide, is to have an open, transparent, trustful environment. That that is our only decision, and that was not controversy, controversial at all. Yeah. What I also thought was just um, the situation, but also it it really enhanced the way that you work and it it, it showed how um, this added to the work that you do and the way you do it is when you bought the first company if i was right you no, that was a, one of the projects i believe that where you were had a maternity leave and you could only um, go in like every three weeks or something like that yeah exactly so yeah so i guess the question is if I'm operational or not, or what? No, that, that, because I, I think the, the the fact that you're not operational, that you, yeah. that the situation forced you to not be operational, and now it's now it's it's the way that you work. Yeah. It's just it's just um, improving the whole situation. Yeah, it helped me not to be operational because that was my aim. But although you are committed, it's really easy to dive into operational. So it helped. So, so what do you say to an entrepreneur, a business owner right now, a founder? Um, what is the first thing that they need to do there? If they want to work this way. Um, uh, how do they step back? Well, yeah, it, it's, how do they, I mean, it's easy. It's like step back, but it's easy in theory, but they have to deal with their control issues, with their enthusiasm, with their drive. And it's not like they want to get rid of it totally because it's valuable for the business, but they have to keep it in check. And by experiences, by experience, the result they get if they do. So it's training and 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 be open to feedback because they always they don't know that they are like bulldozers. 
Uh, and they ask, where are all the people? They're so far behind. Why, why aren't they with me? Sort of, because they are not aware. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really hard for entrepreneurs, especially. I, I meet a lot of them because, uh, yeah, they have so little awareness of how it could be. I just uh, thought of like a, a metaphor almost like, you know, in this pandemic, a lot of people, there's a lot of debate about like, you know, I'm, I'm young, for example, I'm healthy. I'm fine. I think I don't need to wear a mask or I don't need to take precautions. And I think it was just in Darden in New Zealand who said like, assume you have the virus and then act that way because then you would protect others and so on. Yeah. Um, and so in terms of, you know, what can entrepreneurs or founders do to step back? It's like, assume you're extremely parental and, and in yours, you know, there are lots of things that you're doing and being that are in the way for other people to step up. Even if you think you are empowering, just assume you're not, and then be curious and ask for feedback. And really, because it's hard for people to give feedback up. So it takes a lot of encouragement and for you to say, I really want your honest feedback because I really want to be, you know, this kind of leader. And I think that there are things I'm doing or being that are not in service of that. So I would be so appreciative if you can give me feedback, you know, if you can point out times when I step in or when I do this, that would really help me. Um, and then you'll be amazed at what people share. <laughs> that sounds like a very difficult thing to do for many people. Um, what I, what I, also I think because Corona, you mentioned it before, we are living in this time right now with the crisis. And um, the, one of the things that I've found was a very positive side of this um, lockdown and virus and everything uh, was the fact that people started to work from home a lot. So uh, before the manager, owner, or whoever, um, thought it wasn't, it wasn't possible that, that this could not be done in their company. It could not be done with their kind of work. It could not be done. They, they wanted the management. They wanted the micromanagement, even if they, did, they didn't call it that way, but they did. And now um, people had to work from home and they had to let go and the trust that they were working on the project when they were not on the phone with them. So, so for me, I think that was a, a very positive effect of this whole situation of working um, remote um, and that you have to let go, that you have to trust that they work on the stuff that needs to do. And they and now they see it's possible. Now they see also that there is an increase of um, productivity of work to be done. So, so I, I, that's really good. Yeah. I just wanted to add the, this um, brilliant Swedish man Bjorn Linden who I interviewed for the podcast uh, who was way ahead of his time really in terms of starting a self-managing company and he told this beautiful story about people that would come and visit his company and would be like wow this is amazing such high trust completely open salaries and at the end he'd say so are you going to do this in your company and they'd say oh well it wouldn't work in our company you know it works here but it wouldn't work in ours and he says why say well you know people I, you know, we just can't trust people to do these things. They'd make bad decisions and so on. And then he says to them, why did you hire stupid people? <laughs> and they're like, well, we didn't, we didn't. And he's like, okay, then why can't they be trusted? <laughs> so he's this brilliant provocative style. Like, why wouldn't you? <laughs> it's a, I think it's a very good question. Why did you hire stupid people? <laughs> and of course they didn't because that will um, say that they were stupid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good question. Uh, um, so, uh, first of all, I, you know, people need to buy this book. That's for sure. Um, I, I need to gift it to people. Um, what what is what is up for the future for Tough after this book? Um, yeah, the future for Tough is to to spread our method really to, to have more people uh, benefit from it and especially we like uh, to work not only with businesses but we also like working with municipalities, schools, public sector, NGOs and so on because it's important that their 
that they work those um, important functions in society. So we want to expand, but it's, we do it very slowly because it takes a long time to become a tough trainer because it's hard to relate in this way. You have to train as the, the managers also need to train and train uh, to, to do it. So that's what we want. How long does it take to become a tough trainer? So two to three years before you do an assignment in the real world. What do you do in the between? What do you do in those two to three years? You uh, train uh, this coaching method of uh, listening under the surface uh, and you train to relate to also the people, uh, the, the participants that you train in, a, in an, in an unhierarchical way, sort of. In, um, so you have to sort of live what you teach. And, and that is a lot of unlearning in that. How did the unlearning go for you, Lisa? <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it's tough. I mean, it's, uh, I, when I did my first tough training, I was, um, I had had some coaching training and I had some like natural abilities, I would say. Um, but I was, I was doing too much, you know, I was working very hard to try and add value. And I was, I also have a pitfall of being too nice and being cautious and tentative and trying to be very polite. And so my, my ongoing journey of development really is to practice being really frank and straightforward with participants, because that is, that's how to really make a difference for them. It's like, if there's something about their way of being or something that they're doing, that's really in the way for them to be an empowering leader it's kind of my mandate as a trainer, as a coach to give them feedback about that without fluff and cotton wool, you know, but to say, Hey, like you talk too much and that's really in the way for you to be an empowering leader, which I know is what you want. Um, so yeah, it, it is a, a challenging process and it, and, but it's one of the things that I love about tough and, and why, uh, why I fell in love with tough because I was looking for that challenge in my life and, we we have regular sessions together as trainers it doesn't matter if you've been in the company for you know 12 years everyone trains together constantly and develops and we all you know we're human beings and in different phases of our life we have different struggles and challenges um so it's really we have a real commitment to lifelong development which i think is really valuable mm -hmm. how many hours do you work as a tough trainer well i mean it's very um, it's self-managed in that sense. So together with your team members, you decide who does how many courses and it, and again, it will flex depending on your, you know, if you have a child or you decide you want to do something else, or you decide you want to like do more, then we have very good dialogues with each other and we're very open and, and always in touch with uh, each other about how much or how little we want to work. So it really depends. Mm -hmm. How many trainers are there now, Karen? Uh, I think uh, like 15 or so um, from, from in being in training to very uh, experienced. How many are there in Sweden? Uh, 11, I think. Okay. Mm. So, and what is your, is there, a, is there a, a, a vision of the growth? How, how many trainers do you want to uh, I think 50 uh, in like 20 years time or so. That's just the number I thought would harvest or maintain the, th the methods. I mean, people would be enough skilled to, to sort of have it uh, sustainable. Do you see yourself at that time, because it's in 20 years, that's, that's quite a long time. Do you see yourself as a CEO still by the time? Yeah, well, CEO is not uh, hard work and tough. It's, some uh, people don't know I'm a CEO because, you know, we don't have, need a CEO. Uh, I would definitely be, you know, involved in tough somehow. Definitely. Right. Okay. So what do you want to add? What did and what, what is it that you need to add right now? I guess something that comes to mind for me is that part of our hope with the book was to 
to really inspire and embolden people to start with where they are, with what they've got. That I think um, you don't need to know everything there is to know about self-management or new ways of working. I mean, there's so much material out there now, which is great, but it's also kind of overwhelming. Um, so we really wanted to inspire people that just by starting to have different kinds of conversations and thinking about yourself and, you know, in what ways am I a bit like a parent or a bit like a child in, in my work context or, you know, like you, I want to consciously go and practice listening now. You know, we really wanted to um, offer people a, a way of starting to explore these ideas without having to use complicated systems or having to know a lot of things that a lot of it is just about shifting to start with shifting the, the way we relate to one another and the way we relate to work. Um, and if you start to do that, the other pieces kind of start to happen of their own volition, you know, it's, uh, so I think we really wanted to contribute with that. So I, I wanted to offer that in this conversation as well, that I hope yeah. it inspires. And the, uh, I just wanted to underscore, it's been said in, in this uh, conversation, but sh uh, change could happen very quickly if you do it with people. Uh, and, and change of attitudes can happen if people choose and see benefit of choosing to change attitudes. So it's possible to change working climates and, and other stuff that needs change very rapidly. But it's not easy, but it's possible to do it fast. I think that the the way you set up the book, um, um, I like it a lot. It, it has, of course, a lot to do with me, what I, kind of books I like to read. Um, it's very simple. Um, there's not a lot of theory in there. And there's three pillars. It's all, three is a good number for me, always. <laughs> and there's five insights. Um, but I think also the... The, the steps, what you talk about first with the companies that you did this as a um, consultant, then the two companies you bought. So you, you became the business owner, experienced that kind of the, 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 the situation from that, from that side. So that's another side. And then in the end, you talk about how this works in TUF uh, uh, um, because it's, um, like you said, it, it it's, it can go fast, but it's also it's also difficult, and you need to maintain it. It's still work today, so it's so I liked it a lot. The the the, the different aspects and faces and um, different kind of views um, from the positions that you came from, Karen. Um, so for me, it was a wonderful book. It's 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 not thick. It's it's easy to read, and um, so it's not filled with theory that you don't know where to start it's um i think it's 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 a good way to get an idea that this is possible for your company and when you are a business owner or a manager um that you want to do this to make at least experiment and and discover and see how you can ask questions instead of uh giving orders so for that i want to thank you a lot um for writing the book, for uh, making sure I got it. <laughs> and um, yes, I hope that a lot of people... No, I have one question. I was talking about this yesterday, uh, two days ago with a friend. And he's working in, in like a situation um, scaling up. Do you know that method? So... He's he's been working with scaling up for a long time, and he has a he has a additional view on it, scaling up with a um, um, purpose, right? So, so it's not just about more and more and more. No, you need to have like a, 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 an impact. You want to make an impact on the world, but you also want to have a good business. So it's a combination of scaling up the right way and have impact on the world. So I asked him. So what do you think about self management? And he says. I think it depends a lot on how, the size of your company. Do you agree? 
Yes and no, I would say, because companies, even, even big ones, uh, are divided into smaller compartments or parts. So, and Elisa knows a lot about big companies that succeeded uh, the same. Of course, it's easier to accomplish in the, in, in the first place. And to, to change a big company, of course, takes a lot. But I would say that it could work. Uh, everywhere. Yeah, I think um, as you were talking before there, uh, I know I was thinking that, um, of course, it's said a lot, but there's no one size fits all. So I think some people will read the book and hate it perhaps and think, nope, this is not for me. And that's fine. But some people will read it and think, ah, this connects with me in a way that I hadn't, you know, I hadn't read anything from this perspective yet. And that you know, resonates with me in some way. So um, in, in that same vein, I think that there are, uh, there's no one way to do self-management. So there are, as Karen says, it's in some ways easier to do self-management on a small scale. But now there are so many, you know, interesting examples and I try to share them on, on the podcast, but, you know, like Haya in China is huge and they have a very different model for, you know, micro enterprise and, you know, totally decentralized or you know, Birdsorg in the Netherlands. So um, there's lots of different examples. And um, yeah, I think we're, we're curious and open to, to lots of different ways of doing it. And, and we think that whatever you try to do, even if it's agile or whatever, that there is, uh, there is something we think in this way of looking at it, which is about, you know, way of being and relating and mindset um, that's worth considering, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, one final question to close it up. What is a book, and not this book, <laughs> that you um, um, advise to people or that you have gifted away a lot? What is one book that you um, think is really good? Well, I, I would say still record assembly hmm. books because they're so down to earth and it's so easy to visualize and picture when he talks about certain people and situations. Maverick so, is the title. Maverick, yeah. So that that still is one that I favor. It's it's in my cabinet as well. <laughs> it's my my book classic. Yeah, Lisa. Oh, that's such a hard question. I know. I'm such I... a book nerd, and I. <laughs> it always depends. I, I usually ask people like, "Well, what what are you looking for?" You know. What did you give away the most? I don't know. I mean, it also changes. There was obviously a time where I was telling everyone that they should read Reinventing Organizations by Frederick Laloux. Um, I think many people have read it now, so it's sort of... <laughs> no. <laughs> you haven't. Yeah, no, I did, but oh, yeah, um, I, I, there's a, still a lot of people that did read that. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I mean, I do think what I like about that book, and there's also the illustrated version of it, which I... I worked with Frederick on, which was really fun. And the illustrated version is, I think, an even more accessible version because some people find the, it's quite a long book and they find it a bit heavy, but the illustrated version is a bit lighter. And now he has these videos as well, insights for the journey. Um, so I do think that's quite a good starting point for people. Um, and I like that he, you know, he has these three principles and he also, he writes in a way that's very heartfelt. It's not like a dry business book. Um, there's something that speaks to people's hearts, I think, when they read it. Great. Okay, so where can people um, find you, read about you, learn about you? So. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, um, well, uh, I mean, we, there's the Tough website, of course, toughleadershiptraining.com, um, and you can buy the book on the website, and you can also see... <laughs> about uh, learn more about the trainings that we do and things like that. Uh, there's also our podcast, Leadamorphosis. So leadamorphosis.co is the website. And there's also a YouTube channel, and Twitter and so on. So we're on all of the social media channels also. Um, and uh, on Twitter, I, my handle is at disrupt and learn. If anyone wants to follow me on Twitter. Uh, yeah. Karen? Yeah, uh, the same, toughleadershiptraining.com. And then I'm uh, Katie Nelius at Twitter. 
and uh, we're, we're also on LinkedIn and everywhere. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for um, talking with me about this topic and spreading your message because I think it's a it's a really great one, and I love um, talking to you in the future. Thank you, thanks. Thank for you us. for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>